I say the radiotherapy atom because there's a lot that can be said about atomic physics, and the field has moved a long way past what I'm about to tell you, but this is the basic stuff that's necessary for developing a working understanding of radiotherapy physics. In particular, this is going to help you understand the next tutorial on how radiation interacts with matter and subsequent tutorials on radioactivity. So we'll be discussing what atoms are made of and what goes on inside them. An atom is composed of a central nucleus which contains protons and usually neutrons as well, surrounded by electrons which hang around the nucleus in the form of shells or orbitals. They're called orbitals because electrons don't actually orbit the nucleus in the same way that the moon orbits the Earth, but we're not going to go into that in this presentation. The nucleus is relatively small. The atom itself is 100,000 times bigger than its nucleus, but whilst tiny, the nucleus is very heavy. It accounts for more than 99.9% .9 of an atom's mass. The configuration of an atom's nucleus, so the arrangement of protons and neutrons within the nucleus, determine its nuclear stability. That is, the likelihood that an atom will undergo a radioactive decay. Electrons don't contribute very much to an atom's mass, but their shells do take up a lot of room, so therefore they're responsible for most of an atom's size. And the arrangement of electrons around a nucleus determines an atom's chemical properties, since chemistry is basically the study of how atoms pass electrons back and forth. Atoms stay together for two reasons. The first reason is that opposite charges tend to attract via the electromagnetic force. So positive charges attract negative charges. Protons are positive. We can say they have a charge of plus one. Electrons are negative. We can say they have a charge of minus one. The opposing charges of the proton and the electron make them want to hang around near each other. So this is what keeps electrons close to the nucleus. On the other hand, light charges repel each other. Two electrons will push each other away because they're both negatively charged and two protons will do the same because they're both positively charged. This electromagnetic repulsion is greatest when particles are close together. Protons are packed together very tightly inside an atomic nucleus, so you might expect them to repel each other, causing the whole thing to fly apart. They obviously don't, since atoms exist, and this is because a nucleus is held together by something called the strong nuclear force. If two protons are close together, then their like charges will push them apart, but if they're very close together, the strong nuclear force grabs them and holds them together. It's a very short range force that only works if the particles are pretty much right next to each other. So the electromagnetic force acts between particles that have charges. The strong nuclear force acts between nuclear particles. So protons and neutrons, protons and protons, and between neutrons and neutrons as well. As the name implies, it's quite strong. When two particles are close enough together, the strong nuclear force is much stronger than the opposing electromagnetic repulsion of two protons. But the electromagnetic force has a much longer range than the strong nuclear force. So if the proton moves slightly further away, the strong nuclear force gives up and the light charges push them apart. Because the electromagnetic repulsion has a longer range than the strong nuclear force, it increases more quickly as the number of protons in a nucleus increases, so with the atomic number. This is because more protons can push on each other from further away, which increases tension within the nucleus as the number of protons increases. This makes atoms with higher atomic numbers less stable, since they're prone to breaking under the tension of all that electromagnetic repulsion. This can lead to radioactive decay. Atoms with a very high atomic number, like the ones on this end of the periodic table, are very, very unstable. They have only ever been manufactured in a lab, they're never found in nature, and they only exist for fractions of a second before they decay. Lead is the atom with the highest atomic number that still manages to be stable. If you add another proton, forming bismuth, it becomes slightly unstable, although it decays at such a slow rate that it was undetectable for many, many years. Heavier atoms, like uranium for example, can still be found in the ground, because while they are unstable, they decay very, very slowly, so there's still plenty left over from when they were first created. The number of protons contained within an atom's nucleus is called the atomic number. This is often denoted by the letter Z. The atomic number determines the type of an atom, so whether or not it's hydrogen, helium, or lithium, for example, is determined by the number of protons within the nucleus. We normally write this number down below the chemical symbol here as part of the nuclear notation. The atomic weight, which we're going to go into shortly, goes up here. I said before that protons have a charge of plus one. Electrons have a charge of minus one. The purpose of the one is basically to illustrate the fact that the charges are equal and opposite. In this case, that means that one proton is able to attract one electron into an atomic orbital. So therefore, the number of protons that an atom possesses determines the maximum number of electrons that an atom 
can possess as well. I say the maximum number because an atom can lose electrons. The process is known as ionization. And an atom that has lost electrons, so an atom that has more protons than electrons, is known as an ion. The protons and neutrons within the nucleus make up most of the weight of an atom. So therefore, we count the atomic weight as the combined number of protons and neutrons. All atoms with the same atomic number are of the same type. So all carbons, for example, have six protons, but they don't have to have the same number of neutrons. Atoms with the same atomic number, but with a different number of neutrons, are known as isotopes. They generally have the same chemical properties, because having the same number of protons means they have the same number of electrons, generally in the same configuration, but they may have different radioactive properties. So the nucleus may be more or less stable, depending on the number of neutrons contained within. When you look at the periodic table, you might expect that given that the atomic weight is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons, that it would be a whole number. But looking again at carbon, it has an atomic weight of 12.01 as a decimal. And that's because most carbons tend to have an atomic weight of 12. They have six protons and six neutrons for a combined atomic weight of 12. By convention, the atomic number goes here, the atomic weight goes here. A carbon sometimes has heavier isotopes. For example, carbon might exist with six protons, and seven neutrons, making for an atomic weight of 13. There's also the isotope that's using carbon data, which is carbon 14. So the value included in the periodic table is an average, which accounts for the relative abundance of the different isotopes. On the next slide, I'm going to talk about how electrons behave when bound to an atom which is important when attempting to understand how we achieve the physics goal of radiotherapy, which is to knock electrons off things. We discuss these sorts of things in terms of how energy moves around. Energy is basically the ability to do stuff, to cause changes. The main kinds of energy that we talk about in radiotherapy are kinetic energy and mass energy. And mass is the amount of stuff, which on Earth at least is analogous to the weight. Now, two fundamental laws of the universe are that mass and energy can't be destroyed or lost. So that's the law of conservation of mass and the law of the conservation of energy. I have no idea why the universe works that way, but it just does. Mass energy comes from the fact that even though you can't destroy mass and energy, you can convert one to the other via this relationship. So I'd imagine you'd be familiar with this equation, E equals mc squared, which basically says that energy is equal to a certain amount of mass. Now you see that energy is equal to the mass times the speed of light squared, which you know must be a massive number, because the speed of light is roughly 300 million meters per second. So what that tells us, that a little bit of mass equals a lot of energy. So mass energy is the amount of energy you get from something when you convert its mass into energy. Electrons surround the nucleus in various orbitals. Each of these orbitals has an associated energy. That is to say that for an electron to inhabit a particular orbital, it has to have a particular energy. Since these orbitals correspond to different levels of energy, we often call them energy levels. Orbitals that are closer to the nucleus have a lower energy than those that are further away. And you might have noticed by now that I keep drawing two electrons per orbital. That's because each orbital can only hold two electrons. Once it has two electrons, it's full. Fundamental to understanding a lot of radiotherapy physics is understanding that the universe is fundamentally lazy. By that I mean that things like to exist in as low an energy state as possible. This is why things fall downward, this is why balls roll downhill. Things move from a high energy to a low energy and tend to stay there. So electrons like to exist in the lowest energy level that they can. They like to be as close to the nucleus as they're allowed to be. If a gap opens up in an electron orbital, an electron from a higher energy orbital will want to drop down and occupy the vacant space. But because each orbital has an associated energy, if an electron wants to change orbitals, it also has to change energy. So if an electron gains energy, it will generally move to a higher energy orbital. It's a process known as excitation. If an electron wants to drop to fill a vacant lower energy orbital, it must lose energy. This is known as relaxation. But we know from the previous slide that energy can't just disappear. It has to go somewhere. So if an electron is dropping down to a lower energy 
and losing energy, it will often emit it as a photon, which is known as characteristic radiation. If the electron loses enough energy, it will produce an X-ray photon. So that's known as a characteristic X-ray. It will occasionally transfer this energy to another electron in a process known as the Auger effect. So to recap, an electron dropping to a lower energy level must release energy. It releases it as a photon. We usually call it a characteristic X-ray. It gives this energy to another electron, which is ejected from the atom. We call this an Auger electron. We've talked about the amount of energy that an electron needs in order to be in a certain orbital, which decreases as you get closer to the nucleus. But each orbital also has a specific amount of energy that you need to add in order to knock an electron out of it. And because the attraction between positive protons and negative electrons is strongest when they're closer together, this amount of energy, known as the binding energy, decreases as you get further away from the nucleus, because the attraction between positives and negatives drops off with distance. 